shock. I felt my face flush, my hand dropped back down to my side. I felt a steam deep down and had the laughter subside. I felt embarrassed for being put on the spot, humiliated as if I had just made a mistake. Everyone in the room had initially laughed awkwardly to try to cut the tension, but it grew quiet and I was standing there frozen, trying to recollect and piece together what had just happened. He made me feel as if I should have felt ashamed of who I was. Up until that moment, I was always content living in two cultures. Being raised in a household that was centered around Filipino culture, I had always identified being a minority. The traditions were enforced and my mother, being the typical Filipino parent she is, took every opportunity to remind me, to remind us what life was like for her in the Philippines. She taught me the language, speaking to me in her native tongue when I was a child, hoping it would somehow stick with me. I remember getting into trouble, only to have my mother chasing me with her bamboo slippery hand, saying, Gusto mo ng palo? Dari palo, walang hiyaka. To that, I would reply slyly, No, I don't want to get hit, Mom. Why do you think I'm running? <laughs> All I remember thinking after that point was, Duck if she throws a slipper. <laughs> we had many moments similar to that, but outside of those, she also taught me the food, making me in charge of separating the little beer wrappers, reprimanding and lecturing me every time I rolled them incorrectly. I sat back and watched as the same hand she worked to the bone in the rice field 20 years earlier, so delicately folded over the rice flour wrappers. She taught me to pay attention to detail and to devote time to being as perfect in my technique as possible. Watching her made me want to do everything with half as much love and care as she did. I was also taught the customs, the etiquette, and the respect for elders. Upon seeing older relatives, I was taught to extend my hand out in an invitation to accept their blessing. I would bend over and lift their arm up ever so slightly, pressing the back of their hand against my forehead. It meant that I was biddable, ready for instruction, open to the lessons and wisdom they wanted to share with me. To do otherwise was deemed disrespectful. One morning in my grandparents' home, I was told that my grandfather's brother was stopping by the perfect chance to show them what I knew about our culture. I still remember what he looked like walking up the steps with his glasses and baseball cap. As I reached out to greet my grandfather's brother, I held out my hand signifying I was going to perform, perform mono. But he stopped me. You can't do that, you are white. This was the first time in my life where being biracial and bi-ethnic served as problematic. In the moment, I felt mortified. I almost did feel ashamed for being what I was, but I thought back to all the precious stories my mother had told me about our family. She told me about my Lola and my Lolo and her life in the Philippines. I knew my mother and her family worked long hours in the rice fields to feed themselves, and that my Lolo fished to keep his family of 12 provided for. I knew that my mother and grandparents had to go through hell to become citizens in a land foreign to them. My Lola and Lolo stayed up reading in dim candlelight, my Lola trying to teach her husband as much English as she knew, which was just enough to pass her citizenship tests. I knew my mother, pregnant with my brother, was covered in a layer of ash while riding an eight-hour trip from Alangapo to Manila after the sudden eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991. Upon arriving, the scene was chaotic. There was no food, no water, and lines for relief were long. My mother had to wait to talk to someone with the Red Cross to contact my father's ship or she would talk to his captain, then eventually him, trying to figure out how she would even fly to the US because she had no ticket. Eventually, she worked matters out and flew to the US alone, hoping to see a familiar face when she landed. If my father had never made the decision, had never made the choice to speak to my mother while he was stationed in the Philippines, I would not exist. If my mother had never made the decision to marry him and move herself across the Pacific Ocean, I would not exist. But my parents did make those choices, and I am here. I am here, and all of me exists. All of me, which is too vast to shove into a box with a label. All of me, which is too complex for some, and all of me, which cannot be defined by just the titles Asian and white. When my grandfather's brother had said this to me, I was eight years old. I hadn't known what he said was wrong. All I knew was how confused it made me feel. I was grounded and felt safe in the sense of who I was because of what I knew from my family. But all that changed when he said those few words. It was like all I knew had, and had been taught had flown out the window. My own family, the one I felt so grounded in, had made me feel alienated. 
I didn't know what race to choose, let alone that I had to choose. I was having an identity crisis that an eight-year-old shouldn't have to worry about for another few years. I shouldn't have been confused with who I was. I mean, isn't that what high school's for? <laughs> the, answer to the answer to this question for me was yes. The high school I attended was predominantly Latino and Hispanic, with fewer Asians, African Americans, and if we were lucky, we saw a few white people. <clears throat> I was confronted with racist comments in those four years, whether intentional or not. People would say things like, so you're Asian, but why aren't you chinky? Are you Chinese? You look Chinese. Oh, you're half white, so that's why you're so light-skinned. I was wondering why you weren't dark like the other Filipinos, and the occasional chinita. They wanted to know what I was because I didn't look exactly like the rest of them. It seemed like this question haunted me. Even on test forms and surveys, I had this choice, this choice of what I was. I had to make this choice of what I was. Thank God for the option of other. <laughs> Even a close friend of mine thought it was somehow funny to throw me into a stereotype. I got a text one evening saying, hey Michelle, since you're white, can I ask you something? Sure, yeah, what is it? <laughs> so what's good on the menu from Starbucks? <laughs> oh my god. Did they really just say this? What the fuck is that even supposed to mean? I thought it was like my Lola's brother reincarnated and was somehow trying to antagonize me. You know, that's really not funny uh, at all. And second, you realize I'm only half white, right? So my answer wouldn't even be valid when applied to your lame ass stereotype. I remember to throw in the LOL at the end to keep it a little, a little more casual. <laughs> Every time someone would ask questions regarding race, I was thrown back into this identity struggle that I faced at eight. That's when I realized what a prejudiced and assholeish thing that was for my grandfather's brother to say to me. I was enraged and wanted to somehow go back in time to tell him exactly what my white little eight-year-old ass thought about what he said. <laughs> I was so angry he had thrown me into this whirlwind of confusion, but I realized I would have been thrown it into it anyhow, and it was okay for me not to know, so eventually I came to terms with the situation. Even years later, after that account, I still struggled with being labeled and categorized, shoved into the boxes and stereotypes, but I look back on my family's struggles, and they're too significant to just let people decide what I am for me. You wouldn't try to fit a whole nation, all of its history, culture, and people into a box, that you just check off, so why did I have to? I've decided I am too complex to be another one of society's categories, another statistic to base their stereotypes on. So for now, I'm still bubbling in other. <laughs> <laughs>